Hello, I'm Michelle Leonard from the property litigation team at Brown Jacobson. This series of short training videos are aimed at estates, teams and surveyors. This session deals with the Section 18 cap on the landlord's claim for damages. During the term of a lease and more commonly on expiry, disputes arise over the condition of the premises. Usually the landlord will allege that the tenant has breached a repairing covenant under the lease and the options available to a landlord in these situations will vary depending on whether the lease has expired or not. Firstly, we will look at the position if the lease has not come to the end of its term. During the term of the lease, if the landlord believes there are dilapidations resulting from the tenant's breach of covenant, the main options for the landlord are forfeiture, carrying out the repairs and recovering the cost, or claiming damages under common law principles. We will now look at each of these options in turn, starting with forfeiture. If a forfeiture claim is successful, the lease will be brought to an end. The requirements are as follows. Firstly, that the lease contains a forfeiture clause, which gives the landlord an express right of re-entry for the breach in question. It should be noted that this is very common in commercial leases. Secondly, that the landlord has first served a notice pursuant to section 146 of the Law of Property Act 1925 on the tenant. And thirdly, that a reasonable period has expired since the notice was served without compliance from the tenant. The time frame will be based on the works involved, but will be at least the time specified in the lease for compliance with a notice to repair. A fourth requirement is necessary if the lease was granted for a term of seven years or more and has three or more years left to run. If so, the Leasehold Property Repairs Act 1938 applies and the notice must include a statement informing the tenant of their right to serve a counter notice within 28 days. The effect of the counter notice is that the landlord would need, will need the court's permission before proceedings can be started and this will only be granted on specific grounds. Regardless of intention, the landlord's right to forfeit can be waived if they know of the breach but take steps which unequivocally recognise the lease as continuing to exist and communicate this to the tenant. For example, demanding or accepting rent. If the breach is a continuing breach, such as failing to keep premises in repair, the right to forfeit will arise again. However, where there has been a once and for all breach, such as failing to put premises in repair, waiver would result in the right being lost until a further breach by the tenant. The next option we will look at is for the landlord to carry out the repairs and then to recover the cost from the tenant. Commercial leases typically contain a clause permitting the landlord to enter the property, carry out repair works and then recover the cost from the defaulting tenant. This is known as a Jervis and Harris clause, and if the right under such a clause is exercised, the landlord's claim for the cost of the work is regarded as a debt rather than a damages claim. As a result, the landlord can avoid the cap on damages contained in section 18, subsection 1 of the 1927 Act. However, the clause may provide for the costs to be recover recoverable as liquidated damages or have some similar wording, in which case it is possible that these statutory provisions will apply. Usually the first step under a Jervis and Harris clause is for the landlord to inspect the property and to record any breaches which the clause refers to. The tenant will then be informed by way of a repairing notice being served. It should be noted that any breaches which are outside the scope of the clause should not be recorded as these could invalidate later steps. The notice will specify a date for the tenant to carry out the works and if they are not completed by that date, the landlord is then entitled to enter the property and carry out the works in the notice. The third option is for the landlord to claim damages, which will be decided under common law principles. The aim of damages are to compensate for loss rather than to punish the tenant. If the lease was granted for a term of seven years or more and has three or more years left to run, the landlord must first serve notice under the Leasehold Property Repairs Act 1938, as discussed previously, and include a statement informing the tenant of their right to serve a counter notice within 28 days. As previously stated, if the tenant serves a counter notice, the landlord must obtain the permission of the court before commencing proceedings. When assessing the level of damages for dilapidations during the term, the starting point is to look at the diminution in the value of the landlord's reversion as established in Conquest and Ebit. If the breach relates to a repair covenant, there will be a statutory element as the limitation con contained in the first limb of section 18, subsection one of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1927 will also apply. 
We will discuss that section in more detail later in this podcast. Essentially though, it states that damages are capped at the diminution in value of the reversion and as such does not dramatically alter the assessment here. On expiry of the lease, the only option available to a landlord is a claim for damages. Vacant premises carry a risk of deterioration and premises which can be relet easily may have works carried out by incoming tenants, both of which could mask the actual condition. Landlords are advised to accumulate evidence of any alleged breaches as soon as possible once the lease has ended, despite the fact that the dilapidations pre-action protocol allows the schedule to be served up to 56 days after determination. Lack of evidence can lead to a reduction in the amount of damages awarded, ranging from a 60% reduction in the case of Latimer and Carney, due to uncertainty over the extent that the value of the reversion was affected, to 75% in Cruise Services and Investment Corporation and Silk because the evidence on diminution was insufficient and unsatisfactory. Regardless of how they are grouped, every item on a schedule of dilapidations is a separate claim and should be the subject of a separate note providing sufficient detail for it to be discussed meaningfully at trial. This could be years after the lease ends. It is also advisable to take photographic evidence of each defect or even a video survey. To reduce costs and time, the landlord and tenant should attempt to narrow any issues in dispute prior to the proceedings, be it the alleged breaches, the extent of the work required or their cost. As previously discussed, the aim of the damages is to compensate the injured party for their loss, rather than to punish. As a result, a landlord cannot recover more in damages than its actual loss, which will be a question of fact. We will now look at how damages are calculated in claims where the lease has ended. The starting point under common law is that the amount of damages for breach of covenant is equivalent to the reasonable cost of carrying out the repair works, plus any consequential loss, for example loss of rent for that period. If the defect has resulted specifically from a breach of a repair covenant, a statutory cap on the amount recover- recoverable is imposed by section 18 subsection 1 of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1927. Although this cap does not apply to other covenants, it may be applicable if there is a breach of decorating covenant, which also breaches a repair covenant, as was established in Latimer and Carney. Section 18 subsection 1 has two limbs. The first limb applies regardless of whether the dilapidations claim was made during the term or at the end of the term. It caps the damages which can be recovered at the diminution in the value of the landlord's reversion. It will generally be the landlord's responsibility to prove that damages should not be reduced as a result of this limb unless the landlord has carried out the repairs. The second limb only applies to claims at the end of the lease. It prevents damages from being recovered if repairs would be superseded by the landlord's proposals to to demolish the premises or carry out structural alterations at the end of the term. It is for the tenant to prove and it is a subjective test, so it relies on what the actual landlord's intentions were at the expiry date, disregarding any later change of heart. In the case of Cunliffe and Goodman, it was confirmed that the landlord's intention must be firm and clearly formed, rather than mere contemplation. In addition, the intention must be achievable, without too many hurdles, giving a reasonable prospect that it will be carried out. To avoid tenants benefiting from their own breaches, The limitation only applies if the landlord's intentions were regardless of the state of repair and not because of them. So, in a claim at the end of the lease for breach of a repair covenant, the basis of recoverable damages is the reasonable cost of the works plus any consequential loss, capped at the diminution in value of the landlord's reversion. As working out the level of common law damages is essential for both leases which have ended and those which are current, we will now look at the principles in more detail. Firstly, common law damages will be based on reasonableness. This was emphasised in the case of Ruxley Electronics Limited and Forsyth, where the tenant was claiming for the cost of rebuilding a swimming pool, which had been constructed to the wrong measurements. Whether the tenant actually intended to rebuild the pool was taken into account, and it was decided that since there was no intention, the loss was restricted to the difference in value, which was held to be nil. Secondly, it is possible that a discount for betterment will be made. The principle of reducing damages by an amount which reflects the extent the works have or would 
put the premises into an improved condition was established in Joyner and Weeks. A possible exception is where the repair works will inevitably improve what was there, for example where an old factory is destroyed by fire and needs to be rebuilt. Even though the materials may be new, if there is no evidence that the new factory contains extras or cost more to construct than a straight replacement of the old factory, it will be unlikely the deduction will apply. We will now look at what can generally be included in a damages claim and what cannot. Loss of rent or service charges during the period in which the works were carried out may be recoverable, as established in Joyner and Weeks. However, it will typically only be recoverable if it is the need to repair which has caused the loss. If the loss was due to other factors, such as market conditions, preventing the premises from being re-let regardless of the need to repair, the claim will not usually be successful. It was established in the case of Skinner's and Knight that the cost of serving a Section 146 notice are not recoverable. However, it is worth noting that the lease may expressly provide for costs and fees incurred by the landlord to be paid by the tenant, and if so, the landlord may be able to recover such costs in so far as they are reasonable. It should be noted that although the costs of inspecting the premises for defects and preparing a schedule of dilapidations are typically unrecoverable by way of damages, the reasonable cost of preparing a schedule has, in one case, been deemed recoverable on the basis it was a direct consequence of the tenant's breach. Generally, any VAT which the landlord incurs when carrying out the repairs and is unable to recover because, for example, they are not VAT registered, will be recoverable as damages, as established in Drummond and SMG Stores Limited. We will look more closely now at how to calculate the diminution in the value of the reversion. The first point to make is that the valuation date will be the date the lease expires, or if there is a continuation tenancy, the date the landlord recovers possession. Under Section 18, Subsection 1, it is necessary to assess the difference in value between a sale of the premises in proper repair and a sale of the premises in their actual condition. The difference usually represents the cost of repairs. However, if there is no difference in value, the landlord will recover nothing. The case of Vandal Footwear Limited and Ryman Limited confirmed that the freehold reversion is valued at the moment it vests in the landlord, unencumbered by the old lease or any new lease. Generally, events which take place after the lease expires are disregarded. However, the courts have taken into account the cost of works carried out by the landlord and a reverse premium given to a new tenant when considering the value of the reversion. It should be noted though that since the damages are based on actual loss, if the works cost less than the diminution in value, only the cost of the works can be recovered. It should also be borne in mind that where there are a variety of methods available for carrying out the repairs, damages will be based on the method the tenant would have chosen, which is usually the lowest in cost. We will end the session looking at some of the practical issues for tenants to consider. Firstly, a tenant should check the validity of any notices which have been served as a precondition to enforcing the breach of a repairing covenant. The tenant should ensure the notice complies with any procedural requirements, refers only to repairs which are the tenant's responsibility under the lease, and any schedules of condition are accounted for. Also, if the schedule of dilapidations includes obligations to reinstate, the tenant should check that they received sufficient notice of any reinstatement requirements. It is also worth considering if the breach has been waived or whether the limitation period has expired. A tenant should also assess whether they can benefit from any statutory safeguards, for example, by serving a counter notice pursuant to the Leasehold Property Repairs Act 1938, if that applies, as this will prevent the landlord from forfeiting without leave of the court. Additionally, a tenant can apply for relief from forfeiture under Section 146 subsection 2 of the Law of Property Act 1925. This section grants the court a wide discretion as to the terms of relief and will usually require the tenant to carry out the repairs as a condition. Also, a tenant's liability for internal decorative repairs can be lifted under section 147 of the Law of Property Act 1925 if the landlord's requirement is unreasonable. It is usually advisable for a tenant to carry out the requested works unless they dispute the defects as it avoids the time and expense of litigation and allows the tenant to dictate how the repair is carried out and by whom, which may also reduce costs. 
Where possible, remedial works should be carried out before the lease expires to avoid being liable for mean profit, which the landlord may demand if a tenant remains in possession after the lease has expired to deal with dilapidations. Having workmen in the property carrying out repairs following a break date can also negate the requirement for vacant possession, as established in NYK Logistics UK Limited and iBrend Estates. Of course, if there are notice requirements which are not complied with, arguably flexibility should be given to the tenant to allow them to complete the works after the term has expired. However, consideration should be given to whether it would be more profitable to operate as normal from the premises until the lease expires and then to deal with the dilapidations, rather than closing early. Thank you for taking the time to watch the video. I hope you found it useful. Details of our other podcasts can be found on our website, bjretaillaw.com. Thank you.